Motorcycles used to be simple. Any mentally deficient squid could make sense of the clear tiered system of motorcycle segments. You would start on a 250 that you got from your buddy on trade for a case of beer and a stack of old nudie mags, and then after a few weeks, you'd pass it on to another buddy, get a 600, some flip flops, and a pair of cargo shorts, and you'd be well on your way to motorcycle greatness. But now you've got 400s, 500s, which are just 450s, 650s, 790s, 990s, and and everything in between that are all seemingly described as middleweight machines. So on today's episode of Yammy Noob, let's break down and make sense of this new middleweight category once and for all. Kawasaki is an interesting case study that shows how complicated the middleweight category can be. For instance, from 1986 through the mid-2000s, Kawasaki sold the Ninja 250 as their flagship beginner bike, though it must be noted that the Ninja 250 is still sold in some international markets. I know we have a big international audience and I'm not looking to get flamed for any microscopic inaccuracies. The Ninja 250 used a 249cc parallel twin engine and was by all means a beginner bike that had no reservations observations about making its use case glaringly clear. That is a big distinction you see in motorcycling today. Many beginner bikes are built to be discreet in their approachability. An entry-level sport bike sold today might have slightly more agreeable ergonomics and an A2 power compliant output, but they are packaged and presented in a way that feels more advanced than you'd maybe expect a beginner bike to be, outfitted with flashy tech and high-end features. So the Ninja 250 was the baseline beginner bike, built for new riders who were unashamed in their lack of experience and looking to get on two wheels, with less concern about trying to squeeze out as much value as possible from their motorcycles. I saw something somewhere that was talking about how previous generation of motorcyclists with more disposable income were more likely to routinely level up their motorcycles. They would stick with a particular brand and move up the tiers of displacement every few years until they ultimately reached the premium large offering. This is a pretty stark contrast to the buying habits of motorcyclists today. With less disposable income and egregious interest rates, riders are trying to get as much bike as possible for their money and experience level while making minimal purchases as they move up in displacement. And manufacturers have taken note. This understanding combined with the changing emissions regulations and production costs have all contributed into the shift of middleweight bikes. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. How are you liking this video? It's pretty cool, right? Well, what if I told you the Yammy Noob YouTube channel was just scratching the surface? We have an entire world of exclusive content that can be unlocked at yammynoob.co. And not just any content, that high test stuff. The content that's a little too NSFW for YouTube, if you know what I'm saying. Become a member and you can join our Discord server, participate in live streams, and get automatic motorcycle giveaway entries. We've got a practically brand new BMW S1000RR that you can still get entered to win. Entries are gonna close on March 29th, so you do not want to wait. And while you're on the site, you can also subscribe to our newsletter to get the most outrageous and out-of-pocket motorcycle content beamed right into your inbox. Becoming a member at yamindu.co is the easiest way to support what we do, so we greatly appreciate your consideration. Now let's get back to the video. Once an Ninja 250 rider had outgrown their machine, if they were looking to stay in the Kawasaki family, they were choosing to adhere to the presupposed tiers of motorcycling. Depending on the year in question, they'd be able to move up to a Ninja 500 or a Ninja 650. The Ninja 500 was sold from 1987 all the way to 2009. The Ninja 500 doubled the displacement of the 250 and offered just shy of 50 horsepower. The Ninja 500 was a respectable machine that offered the sporty styling of the Ninja but with way more comfortable ergonomics and versatile power delivery. And that's not to say that some riders didn't just start on the Ninja 500, many certainly did, but it wasn't so much the default choice the Kawasaki felt the need to do away with the Ninja 250 entirely. Eventually, the Ninja 250 would be replaced replaced by the Ninja 300, and the Ninja 500 will be replaced with the Ninja 650. The Ninja 650, like the 500, using a modest parallel twin engine, offered a street-focused riding experience that contrasted the high-revving race replica middleweight super sport bikes like the ZX6R and the ZX7R. Again, many people have started their motorcycle journey atop a Ninja 650, which is not the most ill-advised decision from a safety standpoint, but not recommended by yours truly based solely on the better bikes you'll find in the beginner plus 
plus category. Since we're on the subject, I guess it's as good as time as any to talk about the difference between middleweight race bikes and middleweight street bikes, a topic that many have discussed readily, but is still a point of confusion for many beginner riders. A 600 class sport bike sold as production versions of race derived motorcycles utilize high revving four cylinder engines, which for a long time was the preferred engine architecture for a race built machine. These short stroke engines have incredibly high RPM red lines, allowing them to continue making power at the peak top of the rev range. This is obviously advantageous in a race setting, but has many disadvantages for the street. A 600 class sport bike has a relatively small displacement, all things considered, and combined with a short stroke to allow for high revs, and you get what many riders would consider is a bike that is gutless down low. This lack of torque low in the rev range is the first glaring disadvantage, and the second disadvantage that is particularly bad for inexperienced riders is the peaky power band. While the top end rush of a 600 is a lot of fun for a more experienced rider, for a young buck who's just trying to get their bearings, ramping up to 120 horsepower the minute you cross a certain RPM threshold is not usually conducive to learning how to deliver smooth and progressive power. Lastly, committed ergonomics are designed for athletic track riding. It's not particularly pleasant for an extended period of time. Despite what you may hear from sport bike chads who talk about commuting an hour to work every day on their Jixxer 600 in the snow, uphill both ways. For all these reasons, we have middleweight bikes that are built for the street. By the early 2000s, alongside street-oriented bikes like the Ninja 500 and 650, you would find the early precursor to the modern middleweight naked bikes we have today, just considered standard motorcycles at that time. Bikes like the Ducati Monster and subsequently the SV650 created a new precedent for practical, fun, and approachable bikes. The Monster is the motorcycle that arguably created the entire modern naked bike archetype. Originally a parts bin special, the Monster quickly became revered for its raw simplicity and the fun, usable power that came from the L-Twin engine. Suzuki then came in hot, copied their homework with the SV650, which took many cues from the Monster with two monstrous, pun intended, improvements. It was cheap and it was reliable. Thanks, Japan. From 1999 until today, the SV650 has been praised as one of the best all-around bikes you can get for the money ever. It lives in the aforementioned beginner plus category where someone with the slightest bit of maturity could start on an SV650 bearing that they have proper training. Making about 75 horsepower and 47 foot-pounds of torque, the characterful V-twin engine in the SV650 makes enough power to keep many riders entertained for years and years. The SV650 is a perfect example of what we consider the 650 class of street-oriented middleweight bikes that make less power than high-revving 600 sport bike counterparts. While less power might not sound like a good thing to the alpha squids out there, the trade-off is more usable power and comfortable ergonomics is definitely worth it. Before the rest of the big four figured out that a twin cylinder engine was the optimal layout for a middleweight street bike, they sold bikes like the Yamaha FZ6 or Kawasaki Z750, which utilized detuned versions of their four cylinder sport bike engines in an upright standard bike configuration. These bikes catered to the street oriented rider for a while, but the middleweight segment was further extrapolated by Yamaha's release of the FZ07 and FZ09. And again, by definition, this middleweight kind of displacement was designed to be in the middle of a small beginner bike like a 300 and an Alpha Chad 1000cc bike. That's why it's kind of broad, it's between 600 to 900 cc's. The FZ07, now known as the MT07, has, very much like the SV650, become a benchmark for the 650 class middleweight naked bike. It uses a 689cc parallel twin engine, which thanks to its 270 degree cross plane crank design, makes power and sound similar to a V-twin engine, eschewing the stereotype that parallel twin engines must be boring. This engine platform paired with the short wheelbase and upright ergos has made the MT-07 a massive crowd favorite for responsible beginners and intermediate riders alike. Seriously, it's a fantastic motorcycle. Similarly, Yamaha released the MC-09, now known as the MT-09, in 2014. Damn, 10 years of MT-09. That's fucking old, aren't I? Now using an 890cc inline three cylinder engine, this hyper naked represents an entirely different arena of middleweight bikes. A category that once seemingly limited to 600cc sport bikes and 650cc standard bikes, the MT-09 makes about 120 horsepower and 70 foot pounds of torque. With very grunty and linear power delivery, the MT-09 represents a fully realized version of a street oriented naked bike, especially now that it is sold in an SP variant that makes huge improvements to handling capabilities. Now obviously you should go without saying, but an MT-09 is not a beginner bike. It's super torquey, super fast, super capable, but it's still technically a middleweight. Yeah, it's confusing. 
The Duke line from KTM also has had huge presence in the middleweight category, a genre that up until recently was home to mostly naked bikes that were decided to be optimal street-oriented style. The Duke 620 and 640 models were KTM's first foray into street bikes, using their experience in dirt bike excellence to craft a peppy, raw, stripped-down street bike in a style not too dissimilar. In 2008, they released the Duke 690, which used a 693cc single-cylinder engine, making about 75 horsepower and 55 foot-pounds of torque. The platform was then elevated in 2017 with the release of the Duke 790, which used a 799cc parallel to an engine that made about 105 horsepower. The 790 was bumped up to 890, which then for 2024 was bumped up again. Go figure. The new Duke 990 uses a 947cc engine that makes 123 horsepower and 76 foot-pounds of torque. By most metrics, that is a pretty serious machine, although it is still considered to be a quote, middleweight bike by KTM themselves, leaving room for the Super Duke 1390 at the top of their offering list. After releasing the 990, KTM also brought back the Duke 790 to serve as their lower middleweight bike. Yeah. So now you have two middleweights, one's upper and one's lower. The Duke 990 lives in the same echelon as the MT-09 and Street Triple 765, which are motorcycles that have engines ranging from 765 to 947 cc's and making about 120 horsepower. It is interesting that these machines live under the same umbrella middleweight terms like the MT-07, which make just 75 horsepower. Additionally, in the wake of the MT-07 and the impending doom of the traditional inline four-cylinder sport bikes, Suzuki and Honda have both created their own parallel twin lower middleweight bikes like the Jixxis 8S and the Hornet 750. And again, I know it's confusing, the Jixxis 8S sounds like it would be an upper middleweight bike, but it only makes like 80 horsepower. I know, it, it's a mess. Each bike providing a similar riding experience based on a torquey linear cross-plane twin design, comfortable ergos, and like 80 to 90 horsepower. And since since time is a flat circle, the Torquey Parallel Twin format has been extended back to fully fared sport bikes. Aprilia really started this with the RS660, which strikes an ideal balance between performance and usability and is a very, very good motorcycle. It makes about 100 horsepower in a linear and usable fashion. It has committed but not too committed ergos and a fully fared body style. Again, by all standard, it is a really awesome bike, and they really did it first, and they kind of did it best. But since then, Yamaha released the R7, which uses the MT-07 platform, built into a fully fared sport bike, and is soon set to release the R9, following the same pattern of the MT-09 engine. Suzuki has also reverse engineered the GSX-8R to further complicate things. So let's take a step back and look at what the general motorcycle categories look like compared to generations past. The beginner bikes are getting bigger. The Ninja 250 grew into a 300, then a 400, now a Ninja 500, which is really a 450. The Duke 390 saw an increase in displacement this year too, and is now a real 399cc single. And of course, CF Moto stirs the pot with the 450SS. Even Aprilia is making a more beginner-oriented sport bike with the RS457. As previously mentioned, it seems like manufacturers are trying to squeeze out as much of a beginner bike as possible, while still being able to classify it as a beginner bike with A2 compliance. This is a pretty different landscape than the 250s used to be able to find on the showroom floors, and that's not even considering the Kawasaki ZX4RR, a bike that defies any modern convention. A track-ready 399cc four-cylinder sport bike that revs to 16,000 RPM should have no place in the present-day dealership, as even four-cylinder leader bikes can't even stay in production, but alas, it exists. Why? I don't really know. Is it a middleweight? It makes 75 horsepower, kind of. And as for middleweight bikes, we still have the 650s that in themselves vary drastically. We have the Ninja 650, R7, GSX-8R, RS660, and their naked and unfaired counterparts are all very differing machines in their power, features, and approachability, despite being in the same relative displacement category. Then in the far end of the middleweight category, you find bikes like the MT-09, Duke 790, 890, 990, and the Street Triple, to name a few, that all make around 120 horsepower, which at one time was considered to be the amount of power made by a super bike. Even the leader bike class is a lot different than it once was, as many companies move away from inline four-cylinder bikes and homologated versions of them also, larger displacement V4 engines are becoming top dog super bikes as well. With the GSX R1000 and R1 being put out to pasture, Ducati, Aprilia, and BMW remain the gold standards. I hope I was able to clear things up and shed some light on the changing tides of the motorcycle class system. Let's get some claps for our editor because I probably listed out 50 different motorcycles that he had to find photos for. So Josh, just give yourself a little <laughs> pat on the back there.
It's really becoming more and more arbitrary as days go on with this new middleweight section. I know I'm speaking to you, but this video is rife with quotations. Middleweight segment class, all those words are just losing meanings as the lines between engine size, configuration, and power output continue to be blurred. So if you want to stay up to date on all the industry comings and goings, subscribe to the channel, head over to Yamadu.co and become a member to get automatic giveaway entries to exclusive content as well, and subscribe to our newsletter for all the jokes that are too spicy for YouTube. Fact. The Maasai people in Kenya traditionally greet each other by spitting. Keep watching Yemi Nerd!